Hello, uh, welcome to this course on uh, nanotechnology, science and applications. Uh, so, this is the uh, introductory class. Uh, this course uh, is uh, should be accessible to anybody with an engineering background uh, or a science background and uh, I expect to take you uh, from uh, very preliminary ideas of uh, what nanotechnology and, uh, uh, and, and its associated sciences uh, through a series of uh, uh, examples of where it is used. So, that is how this course will be designed um, and uh, in this class it is which is an introductory class. Uh, I will uh, lay the framework uh, of uh, some of the ideas that are necessary for us to understand uh, uh, nanoscience and technology. Uh, and if you are just interested in just getting a quick overview of nanoscience and uh, nanotechnology, then probably this uh, introductory class will provide you with that kind of a quick overview. Uh, so, if you can actually see here, uh, I have drawn a cartoon of uh, something going down in size and uh, or a sketch of something going down in size and uh, that is at some level that is fundamentally the idea between uh, uh, of uh, nano science and nanotechnology, um, but there is more to it uh, we will see as we progress uh, through this uh, class and this course. So, that is our uh, start for the class and uh, uh, in this course as such um, we are I over and above this introductory class that I am going to have here. Uh, we are going to look at the history of nanomaterials uh, because it is uh, nice to get a sense of uh, how old it is and how long it has been there because it has been uh, in popular discussion uh, much more significantly let us say in the last 20 years. Um, and today if you see uh, if you take anybody working with materials uh, in any technical institute uh, anywhere in the world uh, there is a very high probability that some of the work that they do uh, is associated with nanotechnology. Um, so, today it seems like the thing to do I mean uh, almost everybody seems to be involved in it, uh, but uh, if you go back let us say 40 years ago you, uh, you might not have heard of this term uh, that much uh, in the literature and uh, so it is it all seems to have come together in the last 20 years or so, but still there is it has an uh, interesting history. So, uh, we will look at that uh, briefly uh, through the course of course, uh, once you talk of materials we have to look at the synthesis process. Uh, so, that will always be an aspect associated with all our discussions uh, in this course. Uh, we will look at different materials uh, and also what kind of application that might come for, but uh, particularly in that context we will look at the synthesis process. And there is a wide range of synthesis processes uh, that are uh, possible and we need to understand what is uh, going on. In, in today's introductory class we will talk about some general aspects associated with the synthesis uh, of nanomaterials and certain approaches that are normally used for the synthesis of uh, nanomaterials. But as we go to progressively uh, uh, later classes, uh, we will look at uh, for a particular material and a particular application, what is that synthesis process that is used. Uh, more specifically, uh, sometimes a process that has been used for a variety of different uh, materials may get modified for the sake of nanomaterials uh, or there may be some uh, particular variation of it which may be used for nanomaterials, we will look at that. Something very similar is also true for characterization. Um, if your uh, characterization broadly means uh, looking at a material much more closely from different perspectives to understand uh, let us say its structure or its composition uh, and so on, uh, its microstructure, uh, crystal structure, lot of different uh, uh, you know details of how that material has been put together uh, and understanding that is called its characterization. And uh, the uh, again if you have been involved with materials at any level maybe you are a material scientist or a mechanical engineer or a biologist or so on, uh, you have already been familiar with a range of characterization techniques and you are uh, already even using those uh, characterization techniques probably. Um, so, once again with respect to nanomaterials uh, there is sometimes a variation of the technique that is used or the data that you get from the technique looks different uh, for the nanomaterial than it would do for a conventional material. Uh, and therefore, for us it is interesting to understand why is the data looking different and uh, what additional information you can get off the nanomaterial by looking at this data that now looks different. Okay. So, that is the idea here about the characterization of nanomaterials. We will look at the unique implications of the nanoscale. Uh, the, uh, this is actually very critical because uh, at the end of the day that is the reason why people are interested in nanomaterials because there are certain unique implications of the nanoscale 
uh, which create certain unique features and that is what makes the whole field of nanoscience and nanotechnology interesting uh, and something that we are uh, uh, you know keen on getting an understanding of keen on finding ways to utilize it for our uh, you know uh, applications and so on so that we will see uh, in addition to just looking at what is the uh, uh, implication here uh, we would also like to understand the scientific basis for the implication so what is the science behind the implication where is it coming from what is is it at something that is happening at the atomic level uh, some other level that something is happening now for a nanomaterial that leads to its behavior being uh, unique uh, creating some unique circumstances with respect to that material what is the scientific basis for it why isn't the same feature appearing for conventional materials why is it appearing only for nanoscale materials so uh, understanding that uh, is uh, particularly uh, uh, of great utility to us so we will look at the scientific basis for that implication and of course we will look at specific applications at the end of the day we want to use these materials uh, it is it is perfectly fine for us to understand interesting science and uh, there is a uh, great utility in just that uh, knowing the uh, science behind uh, something interesting that's happening in uh, a material but uh, from a engineering perspective we are also interested uh, in applications uh, the general public is also interested in applications and so on so we will look at specific applications now i must point out that even though i have put it, put this all up in some kind of a linear scale here one after the other uh, in reality certain topics i might uh, deal with separately so for example the history we might deal with it uh, deal with the historical aspects of this separately but many of the other aspects the synthesis the characterization uh, implications of the nano scale the scientific basis for that implication and also specific applications this may come as a package so we will actually look at a particular material uh, see how it is going to be used for something interesting uh, as a nano material and in the context of that material we will look at its synthesis we will look at its characterization uh, what is it that is uh, interesting about that material in the nano scale what is the scientific uh, basis for that interesting feature uh, for that particular material the nano scale and also its application so uh, we may package it differently as we go class to class to class uh, but this is the general idea so we will try to put all this information out and then uh, towards the end we will try to do a summary uh, when we finish this course a summary of uh, you know what all we have learnt uh, together uh, in this course and how these things have been uh, uh, related to each other so this is what we will do in, in this course as an overall uh, activity more specific to this class which is the introductory class uh, our learning objectives are as follows uh, we will first try to define what is a nano material so uh, nano materials again uh, is a term uh, that gets used quite extensively today in uh, popular literature if you read newspapers if you read magazines and so on you will see some mention of this um, you may also see it in journals and so on uh, where uh, you are doing much more uh, you know uh, in depth analysis of uh, uh, and systematic analysis of uh, some research so there you will also uh, come across this term nanomaterials nanotechnology and so on so let's try to see if there's some kind of a definition that we can use for nanomaterials so that we will see uh, we will try to explain why nanomaterials are of interest so that is uh, another aspect uh, that we shall uh, focus on uh, we will also look at different types of nanomaterials interestingly uh, again uh, based on where we came across this term or, or in what context we came across this term uh, we may think of a certain type of uh, material or a certain range of materials as the nanomaterials uh, so it, it is of interest to spend a few moments at least to see what are the different types of nanomaterials that are out there so that it gives you some sense of perspective that this is the range and therefore if i am reading a paper a journal paper uh, on some particular type of nanomaterial within this range this is where i am uh, and and also that there are these other things that are not being dealt with in this particular paper so to give you that sense is where we will try to get a sense of the different types of nanomaterials that uh, we might encounter okay we will also look uh, in a from a broader sense as i said later in this course we will look at synthesis from for a, every specific material that we are looking at we will consider its uh, synthesis process uh, and uh, uh, implications of the synthesis process and so on uh, but broadly for nanomaterials uh, the general types of synthesis uh, uh, processes that are available can get classified into a few different uh, uh, varieties so this broad classification is something that we will look at in this particular class uh, so in that is what i mean by saying we will look at the different options available for synthesis of nanomaterials uh, so if you are in a lab 
chances are you are using any technique you use for synthesizing nano material will fall broadly within these classifications that I will show you. And uh, each type has uh, certain uh, you know positives and negatives and challenges associated with it. Uh, and therefore, knowing what you are uh, where you are in the synthesis uh, uh, arena uh, really helps you uh, focus your effort on certain aspects and it also uh, tells you upfront that you know these are some limitations. So, you are uh, prepared mentally ahead of time that when you get done with your synthesis this you are going to have some issues of certain nature. So, we can uh, you know accordingly deal with it. And finally, we will look uh, we will mention challenges associated. So, this is important challenges associated with work in the area of nanomaterials and this is important to know because uh, as researchers many of us are working with nanomaterials. So, we need to know what are those challenges uh, and uh, know how significant those challenges are, uh, how alert we need to be to those challenges uh, and um, perhaps the fact that you know now we have to keep thinking at the back of our mind we have to keep thinking of ways to mitigate these challenges. Uh, th that is as a researcher in addition uh, if uh, to the extent that nanotechnology becomes a very successful uh, field and it is in that uh, you know headed in that direction, uh, you will find increasingly you are going to find products uh, that are out there which the public will be handling uh, which will be consisting of nanomaterials. So, what are the challenges there, uh, what are the concerns there, what is the safety issues involved there and so on. So, th these are some things that we need to pay some uh, attention to. So, in this class we will also look at the challenges associated with working in the area of nanomaterials. Okay. So, uh, let us begin with a material in general. So, uh, uh, and in, the, in that context let us try to understand what is it that we are referring to as a nanomaterial. So, normally uh, you may go and you know have uh, let us just say you have a brick in your hand. Okay. So, a brick physically has some shape it has a length, it has a width and it has a uh, height. Okay. So, length, width and height it has. So, it is a solid object you can hold in your hand. So, now uh, you have a range of possibilities even though you have a solid object in your hand I can give you uh, essentially I mean something that is shaped like a brick I can give you 3 or 4 different samples which outwardly look the same but internally are dramatically different. So, I have just shown you on this slide uh, various options that you could have. So, the first option that is out here is a situation where these are let us say these are crystallographic planes let us say these are crystallographic planes which means on these planes the atoms are in perfect order. So, whatever is the interatomic spacing they hold that interatomic spacing in that plane and in this direction they have the known interatomic spacing aligned in this direction. Okay. So, so you have the series of planes in perfect each plane is also having atoms in perfect order and then those planes are arranged in perfect order. Importantly in this sample which is marked A you have the planes in perfect order from this end to this end this entire stretch of this sample you have planes in perfect order. This is referred to as a single crystal So, this is a single crystal and uh, both in the laboratory as well as commercially you can buy single crystals uh, single crystals which are of significant size something that you can actually hold in your hand comfortably you can hold uh, the single crystal in your hand you can you know look at it uh, uh, through the light uh, I mean with light shining through it or light falling on it and then uh, you can do experiments with it. So, uh, you can get single crystals in macroscopic scale. So, you please remember that means you know you are having a sample in your hand which you can hold in your hand and atomically from one end of the sample to the other end of the sample atoms are in perfect order in uh, throughout the entire uh, length of the sample entire height of the sample entire width of the sample it is in perfect order. So, that is a single crystal. Uh, we next come to another sample here which is mark B you can see here these are all like grain boundaries here which means within this grain within each grain the uh, uh, atomic planes are in perfect order. So, within the grain you can see all these uh, planes are in perfect order. So, it is it is like you have taken the sample uh, A and uh, you know sort of broken it into like uh, in this case let us say 4 pieces and uh, you know done some little rearrangement and then assembled it back. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, you let us say you take uh, uh, 4 samples of A each of which has a different orientation and then you break it up along similar uh, you know geometries and then put it back together. So, that each is individually a part of the original sample, but 
within it the, ori the orientation of the same planes that you see in A are now oriented this way. Here the same planes are oriented vertically, uh, here the uh, planes are oriented at this inclination, here they are almost horizontal and so on. So, uh, clearly you can see if you go from this end to this end perfect order is not maintained. Right. So, you see changes in order distinct changes in order not subtle changes in order distinct changes in order which if you go from this end to the other end. So, this is a sample that is polycrystalline with large crystal size. Okay. So, it is polycrystalline with large crystal size. Um, and so, so that is another option that you have. Sample C here is an example uh, where you it is also polycrystalline but with small crystal size. So, you can see here several crystals I have drawn here. I am just uh, highlighting a few. So, we will just assume I mean this is just a uh, you know sketch. So, it does not have to be exactly like this uh, uh, I mean this is just a uh, you know a representation of what you can expect in the material. I am just saying that in this case it so happens what I am showing you are all uniformly sized uh, grains. These are each individually called a grain each of them and all of them come together to form this sample C. Please note between A, B and C the overall size of the sample is the same right. So, the physically what you hold in your hand if this were a sample that you could hold in your hand physically these three samples are all of the same size. They are also of the same composition you are using the same atoms to uh, make these samples they are also having the same crystal structure. So, whatever is the atomic arrangement uh, within this uh, sample that atomic uh, you know geometry between the atoms is maintained the crystal structure is maintained there is no difference between these three only difference is the crystal size. So, the first one consists of one large single crystal, the second one consists of four or five in this case uh, five large uh, crystals put together uh, which forms the same uh, external dimension. The third one which is C has several small crystals which all come together and form this uh, sample. We can consider uh, another option D where you uh, uh, which is also polycrystalline, but the crystal size is extremely small and we are almost not able to make it out with let us say we are using an optical microscope we are not able to make it out using an optical microscope. So, let us say this is polycrystalline with very small crystal size. Okay. So, if you have polycrystalline with very small crystal size then uh, you, you sort of see what uh, the sample D might look like you can imagine that you are headed in that direction. So, it is in this manner with keeping the overall sample dimensions the same you can move from a large crystal size to smaller and smaller and smaller crystal sizes and at some point we say that this is a nano crystalline sample it means the crystals here are in a nano crystalline uh, uh, size range. So, we will see what that size range is it is basically uh, an uh, indication of the fact that the size range of the crystals has become extremely small it has gone into the nano scale. So, that is the idea and that is how uh, when you do that you are approaching a nano crystalline material uh, there is certain more subtle aspects to it, but broadly this is the direction in which we are heading. So, a nano material uh, is one where the particles uh, that are present in the material have one or more dimensions less than 100 nanometers this is like a broad definition. Okay. So, a broad definition if you want to have it has one or more dimensions. So, you can think of materials as always having three dimensions, but if uh, it does not mean that all three dimensions have to be less than 100 nanometers if one or more dimensions happens to be less than 100 nanometers chances are you are working with something that you can call as a nano material. Okay. So, that is the uh, sort of the starting point at which we start thinking of uh, in terms of a nano material. Uh, there is still some more uh, detail here that you uh, need to think of and that is the idea of the nano effect. I call it the nano effect just for uh, so that we can focus on this idea uh, and, uh, and that conveys something. The reason I point that out is that it is not sufficient if one or more dimensions is less than 100 nanometers. 
okay. So, like I said that is just the starting point for the definitions. It says that if you are in that range chances are you are working with something that is a nano material. But for us to actually call it a nano material uh, in any meaningful sense you can still you can insist that oh it is less than 100 nanometers I will call it a nano material. You can do that but uh, if you want to meaningfully call it a nano material you, you should see you should be dealing with a situation where not only is the size less than about 100 nanometers, but you are also seeing some change in property, some change in one or more properties that is related to the fact that it is now less than 100 nanometers, that it is in that size range, okay. And more specifically, many properties already have a size dependence, okay. So, many properties that you see So, uh, many properties already show you some dependence on size, but the thing is when you are coming from this macroscopic you know single crystal to smaller and smaller and smaller crystals there will be a trend, there will be a certain trend in the way the property changes, okay. So, or it may be a weak trend, it may be a, uh, a reasonable trend etcetera. As the particle size changes you will see a certain change in the property. What is interesting about this effect that I am calling the nano effect is that at certain size range the impact of size on the property is dramatically uh, significant, it is dramatically exaggerated. Suddenly you see a very significant change in the value of the property uh, because you have now come into a certain size range, okay. And only when you only when that happens you are actually seeing a nano effect. If you are not seeing that there is no great uh, you know interest in having small crystal size. The interest comes only because when you get to that small crystal size suddenly the property is dramatically different. So, whereas uh, initially that material could only be used for a certain range of applications because its property was in a certain range of values. Because you have now come to the nano scale suddenly its property has new set of values then the same material can now be used for newer applications right. That is the interesting thing that since you came to the nano scale the same material is now showing you completely different properties and because of that you can take the same material and put it for completely new applications. This combination where a size change leads to a dramatic change in properties uh, and therefore enables you to use it for new applications. This concept which seems to happen in the nano scale which seems to happen in this 100 nanometers or less scale is the whole idea between uh, which is the is the whole idea behind this uh, uh, topic of nano materials, nano science and nanotechnology. okay. So, that is the nano effect. So, what is a nano material? Let us see something more about what is a nano material. So, let us start with something we can relate to. So, let us ask ourselves how tall are we right. So, what is a typical height? So, let us say I mean uh, most of us are more than 1.5 meters tall. So, let me just put a value 1.5 meters. Uh, we will always like in any population you will have some distribution of people who are taller and some people who are shorter and so on. And of course, based on your age group it might change. So, let me just put some number down 1.5 meters. Okay, so, 1.5 meters is how tall we are. So, that is something we can associate with. So, we will start from there and then we will associate with other things. On our body we have hair and that hair is if you look at the dimensions of that hair that is about 50 microns. So, this is 50 into 10 power minus 6 meters. Okay, so, 50 into 10 power minus 6 meters is how uh, thin our uh, human hair is. Um, along similar lines our the pores in our skin is also of the same nature. So, we have about again something like 50 into 10 power minus 6 meters and that is why uh, with those dimensions being somewhat similar uh, the hair is able to stay in our uh, skin. So, that is the uh, pore of our skin right. So, this is uh, again 10 power minus 6 meters. If you look at the wavelength of visible light okay. So, wavelength of visible light. So, uh, this is 10 power minus 7 uh, meters. So, uh, less than uh, dimension of hair So, wavelength of light is less than the dimension of hair. So, uh, hair is uh, 50 into 10 power minus 6. So, that is actually 5 into 10 power minus 5 uh, meters 
this is 10 power minus 7 meters. So, uh, almost 2 orders of magnitude less than the uh, dimension of our hair. So, that is light that is what we are able to see. So, if you are able to see our hair, so whatever hair you see on your hand, uh, if you look at that dimension, if you go 100th that dimension, that 100th the width of the hair, then you are in the dimension of the light, uh, the wavelength of visible light. So, you can see somewhere there our eye is limited, right. So, we are able to see uh, individual uh, hair strands of hair, but you cannot see individual you know, waves of light. Uh, so, that is the uh, uh, wavelength of uh, uh, light is like that and uh, that is how it is. A nanometer is 10 power minus uh, 9 meters and hence the word nano 10 power minus 9 meters. Uh, incidentally, if you look at uh, the interatomic spacing in most materials, if you look at interatomic spacing that is of the order of uh, 2 angstroms interatomic spacing that means uh, which is equal to 2 into 10 power minus 10 meters. Therefore, if you look at 1 nanometer that is roughly so this implies 1 nanometer has uh, approximately 5 atoms. So, 1 nanometer has 5 atoms. So, uh, that is the uh, uh, thing. So, that is how you can relate the size scale. So, 5 atoms if you take and you are in, in you are into the nanometer range. Okay. So, that is uh, uh, how we are. So, uh, we are coming down in the scale. So, if you see here nano materials as we said are typically between anywhere between 1 nanometer and 100 nanometer in dimension. So, 1 nanometer to 100 dim, uh, nanometer in, uh, in any one dimension may be more than one dimension. So, you are looking at uh, anywhere from uh, uh, 5 atoms to 500 atoms. So, typically if you say a nano particle chances are it has somewhere between 5 atoms and 500 atoms that is. Uh, so, this is there is a little bit of uh, you know uh, fuzziness in this definition uh, we are mostly used to uh, much sharper definitions in uh, science, but there is a little fuzziness in this. Uh, as we progress along the course you will understand the need for this fuzziness uh, even later in this class I will uh, bring that out uh, as to why we have this fuzziness in this uh, definition. We do not have a hard cut off saying that you know exactly at 252 nanometers is what we are going to use it does not work that way we have a range. So, we will think about it. So, having put this down together let us revisit this question. Today everything is in nano uh, material uh, world we talk of nano materials a lot. So, it would not be surprising if you ask somebody how tall they are and they say they are 1.5 billion nanometers tall. One point five billion nanometers tall. Okay, so you can see how suddenly you know if you want to be in the nano uh, world, this is how you will have to talk. Okay, so that's just for you know uh, giving you a sense of perspective. But uh, this is sort of some of the data that is of interest. Why do we care about nanomaterials? So why should we uh, be interested in nanomaterials? Well. What happens is basically this, this is uh, this uh, what we are going to discuss at this moment is really this nano effect and what is this nano effect let us get a better sense of it. The idea here is this various macroscopically measured properties. Okay. So, various macroscopically measured properties what are these properties let us say electrical conductivity, let us say uh, magnetic properties, uh, some uh, let us say mechanical strength. Okay. So, these are all properties that we measure of so many materials that tells us where we can use that material. So, if you want to use something for a bridge you expect certain level of properties you look for a material that has those properties you use it. If you want to use something for the landing gear of a plane again there is some expectation of some properties you look for that material which has those properties you put it to use. So, we there are properties and we measure those properties. What is important is that various macroscopically measured properties are based on phenomena that occur at an altogether different size range. Right. So, you are measuring you are having a sample in your hand let us say you are doing a mechanical uh, you know strength measurement tensile test you are doing then you will take a dog bone sized sample. So, some sample that looks like that ok a dog bone sized uh, dog bone shaped sample which you will take and this is what you will use for your mechanical test. So, this sample 
could be I do not know let us say this is 20 centimeters, this could be 20 centimeters tall sample right and using this sample you get a uh, you know stress strain curve from which you uh, pick out lot of properties of the material mechanical properties. But what is important is that the mechanical property is coming from phenomena that are occurring at much smaller scale. So, it is some small inside the grain in terms of how the planes of atoms are moving, how they slip uh, with respect to each other that is where that phenomena is occurring. So, it is occurring in the you know planes of atoms range that is where it is happening. It is not happening at the sample size, the sample size is simply consolidating all that information and showing it to you in, in a manner in which you can uh, you know uh, record. But it is coming from a phenomenon that is occurring well inside the sample at a much much more microscopic scale ok. So, it is so that is the first thing we should understand. The first thing we should understand is many properties that we measure it could be mechanical property, it could be optical property, it could be a magnetic property etcetera. In many cases we are measuring that property for uh, using a sample that is reasonably large which we are able to hold in our hand which we are able to mount on a measuring instrument. But the phenomenon that is occurring inside that uh, sample which is resulting in that property is actually occurring at a much smaller size scale ok. So, it is occurring at a much smaller size scale due to something maybe that an electronic level, something uh, at an atomic level, something at the level of planes of atoms etcetera. Each phenomenon, each property is based on some phenomenon occurring at some one of these levels right. So, so that is the that is the first point that we uh, need to uh, keep in mind ok. Now, if you manipulate the material at or near this size range, if you manipulate the material at or near this size range from which that phenomenon is happening. So, if the phenomenon is happening at an electronic level you should get down to size ranges closer to the electronic level. If it is happening at the atomic level you should get down to sizes which are close to the atomic level. Tens of atoms cause that phenomenon then you should get down to that size range of tens of atoms. If you do that then you end up having a totally new control on the material property ok. So, what do we mean by this? Let us say a mechanical property uh, has some range ok. So, uh, some tensile strength has some certain range of values. Now, uh, since you know that it is happening at the range uh, it is happening due to a phenomenon that involves planes of atoms. If you start creating a sample where the crystal size is getting close to the range of a few few uh, uh, let us say few planes of atoms then suddenly you get new control on the mechanical property and the mechanical property looks dramatically different ok. So, therefore, if you uh, uh, and it just happens that way that many of those properties if you start uh, uh, you know rearranging the material at the size scale from which that property is coming then you are sort of rearranging that uh, phenomenon itself you are rearranging that phenomenon and that leads to dramatically different property coming from the material which has exactly the same chemical composition and many times the same crystal structure. And therefore, manipulating materials at or uh, this uh, at or near this characteristic size range often results in new control on the material properties which is why the nano material becomes interesting because now with the exact same material in, in olden days this control was not there. In olden days if you came up with a new application uh, let us say uh, you could use a material up to 800 degrees centigrade ok and at which point uh, some uh, phenomenon is not working as well. So, typically you could not use it higher than that uh, in temperature even though let us say its melting point was only uh, 1500 degrees C. Now, by manipulating so in the in olden days what would happen is let us say you came up with a new application where the uh, application had to operate at 1100 degrees centigrade. So, at 1100 degrees centigrade this material that you currently have will not function right. So, it because it uh, its property is not that good at 1100 degree C it was good at 800 degree C. So, what is the approach people did in the olden days? So, they would abandon this material they would search for a new material new composition uh, for which they will try to understand uh, if they can make it operate at 1100 degree C with all the properties that are required for 1100 degree C. So, they will search around search around through the periodic table search for various combinations of elements uh, and so on use some scientific process uh, and then arrive at this uh, new material. What is the problem? The problem is that uh, you now have to have new synthesis process for this new material you have to have new uh, you know appliances uh, new industrial setup for it uh, you will have new environmental concerns for it the costing may be high because you are looking at some more exotic material. So, many problems associated with repeatedly trying to come up with some totally new material to uh, address a new requirement. 
if you deal with nanomaterials because you are able to change the property or control the material property and change it dramatically by simply going to the nano scale you can actually use the possibility opens up that even at 1100 degree C you can use the same material that was previously usable only up to 800 degree C. The huge advantage is that all your you know, industrial processes are uh, you know significantly unaffected your whole procurement process is unaffected so many things are unaffected uh, even you know uh, compatibility issues are not there uh, often when you put dissimilar materials together there are compatibility issues in terms of uh, coefficient of thermal expansion reactions between those materials and so on all those things can be avoided because you now have the same material giving you new properties and that is why this is of interest we are also able to come up with new interesting nanostructures and just because the structure itself is different we get a unique set of properties okay so all these things come together the fact that you can get new properties you can get new structures and with the new structures you get even more new properties so this whole combination is uh, why nanomaterials are of interest and that is why uh, so much of research has now moved into the direction of uh, nanomaterials so what are the different types of nanomaterials that we are likely to encounter uh, interestingly uh, uh, again as i said you know due to popular reading due to what we read in journals and magazines and so on we may think of certain things when we somebody says nanomaterial but there is more to it and that is why we would like to discuss this in a more systematic manner first of all you may or may not be aware there are nanomaterials that be, that are basically natural nanomaterials that means in nature we already have these nanomaterials what are such uh, materials for example we have smoke uh, you could have uh, volcanic dust you could have bacteria so these are all things that are already uh, materials which are in the nano scale and have many uh, aspects associated with them that we could call uh, we could reasonably say that it is a uh, nano material and but these are of a natural uh, uh, you know processes we could also have incidental nano materials so what is incidental nano materials in fact for the longest time uh, in uh, technical uh, activity much of the nanomaterial that was there was incidental nanomaterial people did not even know that they had synthesized nanomaterials it, it just so happened that in uh, in the normal synthesis process uh, nanomaterials had been synthesized they were unaware that they had synthesized nanomaterials and so this is unintended by uh, uh, result of human activity okay unintended result of human activity and for example things like exhaust from diesel okay coal combustion welding fumes these all contain fine particles which are in the nano uh, scale and uh, as a result uh, we have uh, you know we have created nano materials without formally aiming to create them without formally synthesizing them later when once people realized that this was happening and then realized that there was something interesting they uh, uh, manipulated their synthesis process maybe using you know ideas from these uh, unintended uh, uh, methods of creating nanomaterials to formally intentionally create the nanomaterial so that is uh, the thing that they have done and that brings us to the third type of nanomaterial that you could deal with which is the engineered nanomaterial this is exactly what i mean by saying you know now we are deliberately creating the nanomaterial we are not accidentally or incidentally creating it we are deliberately creating it we are deliberately setting our synthesis technique parameters such that the nanomaterial is produced in significant quantities so this is intentionally created and there are many examples these are just two that you know possibly immediately stick in our mind uh, one is the nanotube so carbon nanotubes uh, is one example and of course fullerenes which are also sort of related to this uh, carbon uh, nanostructure so these are two that uh, you might have heard of lot in the uh, uh, in li popular uh, literature uh, so there are various variations of this and so on but these are engineered so people have deliberately aimed for these uh, materials and created these materials so you can have natural nanomaterials you can have uh, incidental nanomaterials which uh, were not really aimed for but accidentally present and you could also have engineered nanomaterials where you deliberately having understood what was going on you deliberately go and seek the nanomaterial that uh, you wish to uh, synthesize in larger quantities in many ways i think today is the age of nanomaterials in olden days we had you know like the bronze age the iron age and so on uh, if you really look at where the technology is gone where human interest is where the scientific interest is where uh, you know uh, technological companies are pushing towards it is all in the uh, area of nanomaterials so uh, you could sort of say that today we are dealing with uh, an age of nanomaterials uh, it is very likely that some of the products you use today already contain nanomaterials in them 
it is uh, it is highly likely that as you go forward more and more products that you use will contain nanomaterials in them. Uh, again as we discussed earlier in the class this does not mean that the composition of the material uh, this does not necessarily mean that the composition of the material has changed maybe it is the same composition as the material you were using 5 years ago uh, except that the uh, and neither might the size might also might not have changed you may still have let us say it may even be a knife you use for uh, you know uh, uh, cooking purposes uh, it is uh, the knife still looks the same it may still be made of the same material but internally if you look at the um, uh, knife in the microscope you will find that the older knife which was say 10 to 20 years ago had a different structure the uh, my, uh, knife that you currently use may have a different structure and enabling it to last much much longer uh, enabling it to do uh, uh, much better cutting of uh, whatever it is that you are trying to cut. So, this is sort of the age of nanomaterials it is almost impossible these days for you to see uh, you can go to the website of uh, almost any uh, university and uh, look at people who are working in material science and engineering. Uh, you, it is almost impossible for you to come across a researcher who is doing uh, nothing in the area of nanomaterials. Almost everybody is doing something in the area of nanomaterials or nanotechnology. That is the extent to which uh, it is uh, now prevalent all around the world and therefore, it is not a major exaggeration to say that we are sort of in the age of nanomaterials. So, if you see here again uh, similar to some of the discussion we just had, we have bulk materials starting out at the large scale, uh, we have particles which again you know you just break something into smaller pieces you particles that you can hold. If you go to even smaller scale as I said if you go into the nano uh, several uh, nanometer size range then uh, if the particles are in that size range then you are dealing with nano particles. Uh, if you go to even smaller uh, uh, somewhere in this area we have something called a cluster which we are not spending much time on it is a certain unique uh, combination which I will briefly touch upon in this class but we will not spend too much time on it. And then of course, if you go all the way down you have atoms. So, you can sort of see how we are going down in size scale um, and uh, dealing with you know different uh, uh, constituents of materials I mean same material, but you know smaller chunks of the material which take you into lower and lower size scales and therefore, you are moving closer and closer to the atom. And so, that is the uh, general uh, tendency. So, as I said we will not spend much time on clusters in this class, but it is just interesting to know what it is. Uh, because it again talks of something small, uh, but generally uh, nanomaterials is a little broader uh, is much broader than uh, just the cluster. Cluster it turns out that you know in, in certain systems uh, collections of atoms that are somewhere between individual atoms or molecules and bulk materials. So, somewhere in the middle um, and therefore, you are talking of anywhere from 3 to you know uh, say 30 million uh, atoms you are looking at some, some collection. Uh, you find that in some materials certain collections of atoms uh, are preferred by that material because it gives it some energy minimization something that is uh, convenient for it to stay that way and therefore, you can actually get some unique properties from it. So, uh, so in fact, they even give this word magic number. Okay. So, for example, with respect to gold uh, one of the combinations is 55 atoms with 55 atoms it seems to form a structure. Uh, uh, where it holds together uh, you know the surface area is uh, sort of minimized uh, if you add an atom uh, the surface to volume ratio goes up if you remove an atom also surface uh, to volume ratio uh, goes up. So, you are putting generating more surface. So, somewhere at 55 it seems to have a sort of a local minimum uh, so to speak uh, of its energy and therefore, it prefers that 55 combination and uh, therefore, that is sort of a you know as it is because it seems to be a you know sort of a random number that you have pulled out of somewhere it is not really random, but since it seems to be a somewhat arbitrary number uh, so to speak they give it uh, they have given it the name a magic number and it uh, is there for some of these uh, atoms. It enables them to create some kind of a stable formation based on some geometry that is stable. So, this is a cluster it has certain unique uh, properties and therefore, gets used for uh, certain applications. Um, as I said uh, nanomaterials is much wider than this. Uh, so, we will not in our course we will not spend much time on clusters uh, this is much more uh, you know very specific uh, combination and uh, needs to be really looked at differently it comes about uh, in a somewhat different way um, and uh, possibly not as prevalent as you know the nanomaterial uh, uh, general sco uh, scope of nanomaterials. Okay, so, if you look at synthesis so in the next two or three uh, slides we will look at synthesis again from a broader perspective uh, we are not going down to any specific synthesis technique, but in general for nanomaterials there is a broad uh, you know uh, uh, possibilities with respect to synthesis. The first is this idea of a top down approach 
I just showed you in our earlier slide we had a large crystal uh, sample having a large crystal size and then you could progressively break it down and then you can you know put those broken down pieces into the same overall shape and therefore your overall sample shape does not look different but it is consisting of many broken uh, you know smaller crystals which are held held together very closely and actually form you know they form boundaries which hold them stably together. So, this idea of starting with something large and breaking it down breaking it down breaking it down to cre create uh, particles which are in the nano scale which can again be put together to uh, you know sort of show you this large overall shape. This is called the top down approach for making nano materials. The uh, uh, good thing about it is that it is extremely conveniently suited for bulk industrial production. So, if you go to any industry they already have machines which are doing something similar already. They are already cutting something down, they are breaking it, they are breaking into pieces then welding it together. So, all industrial processes are already set up for larger scale materials which they can handle easily. So, if you want to uh, make nano materials uh, and you want to make it such that the industry readily accepts it, readily incorporates it into their uh, processes, it helps to have a top down approach to create that nano material. So, that the industry uh, existing machinery in the industry or some uh, you know relatively minor modification of that existing machinery will enable them to take this technology that you are trying to give them and put it for production. Okay. So, therefore, uh, a top down approach which breaks uh, breaks a large scale uh, large crystal size material into a nano material and progressively uh, wears it down to a nano material is uh, suited for uh, from that perspective. Problems are the following, uh, we invariably have crystal imperfections because you are hammering it down breaking it down let us say you may start with a hammer and break it down then you may put it in some other you know machine which keeps grinding it and breaking it further and further and further. So, you will introduce imperfections which may not necessarily be convenient or useful from the perspective of the property that it is trying to demonstrate or the property that you think will uh, will get uh, you know highlighted when you go into the nano scale. So, imperfections will add an additional variable into the system which may be good may not be good. So, you have to deal with it. So, therefore, crystal imperfections are something that you have to worry about and a top down approach tends to do that. Surface imperfections also come uh, because of again this uh, same uh, uh, you know uh, process. So, if you wanted a certain shape to that particle it may not have that shape, it may have some different shape because of the surface imperfection. You may also end, uh, end up introducing impurities because uh, you are breaking something down, you are using a hammer. So, some uh, hammer or a you know ball mill or something you are using to break it down. So, some atoms from that uh, material may also end up in this material which you are uh, working with and uh, therefore, uh, you may introduce impurities and that is not necessarily something that you are interested in. An example of uh, this process is mechanical grinding which is simply using for example, using a ball mill where you have a series of uh, you know hard balls which are like tungsten balls inside a cylinder and they and the cylinder rotates. We will see this technique in greater detail later, but those balls keep on beating the material that you uh, that you want uh, broken down which is also uh, loaded into that cylinder. So, mechanical grinding is a way in which you can go about it. So, this is the top down approach. Okay, so, this is uh, uh, the way it is and certain aspects associated with it. Also related to the synthesis is the exact opposite approach which is the bottom appro approach. So, this essentially means from the way the word is uh, the term is defined this is sort of starting from the uh, atomic scale at or near the atomic scale. atomic size scale. So, you start with one or two atoms and then from there you build up the nano particle. Okay. So, that is how you build it up. The nice thing is nature uses this technique. So, if you look at nature generally of course, in nature also you have wear and tear. So, if you take pebbles they are being worn down by nature right, but generally anything else in nature if you see a plant growing you see even life coming you know coming together uh, human life or animal life everything it starts small and then grows big right. So, that is a general growth process. So, nature typically does that everything it starts with some very tiny template and then builds more and more of the template and slowly you see this uh, mega structure that has come about. So, nature uses this technique. Uh, so, you can mimic certain processes from nature if you are trying to do this bottom up uh, approach. It is very useful for nano creating a nano structure. So, creating you know like carbon nano materials or some interesting nano structure it helps to sort of start from separate atoms and put it together under some control conditions. So, that that structure builds right. So, therefore, uh, whereas if you start from big and break it down 
very small number of particles uh, by you know sheer statistics may have the structure because you are just you know randomly breaking everything down you do not have that level of control. Whereas, if you start from the atomic scale and grow it up you have much better control. Again uh, because you are starting from the atomic scale and you are controlling the atoms that are present there usually it is much more homogeneous with respect to chemical composition and usually you also have much better purity. You are not going to have extraneous things uh, being pushed into the material because you are avoiding extraneous contact you are controlling the contact that the material has with whatever is uh, around. So, a good example is chemical precipitation you precipitate out uh, some uh, you know uh, constituent from a solution uh, you could also have some condensation process some uh, vapor is formed and then it condenses on a some substrate and you create it. In all these cases you are creating sort of uh, separate atoms and then they come together to create the structure that you want this is the bottom up approach. In both top down approach as well as bottom up approach what are the goals that we have from the perspective of nanomaterials, nanomaterial functioning, nanotechnology uh, and so on what are the goals that we have. The first thing is that uh, there is a uh, significant interest in having all the particles of uh, to be of identical size specifically because the uh, property that you are seeing from, uh, from the nanomaterial or nanotechnology perspective, nano science perspective. Uh, is a very size dependent property. So, if you had the size of the particles to be all of 10 nanometers you will see some property if all the particles were actually of 15 nanometers you will see a different value for that property that is the whole interesting part of the nanomaterial uh, and nano science uh, field. So, therefore, if you have a, a sample where you have a mix of 10 nanometers and 15 nanometers you are neither seeing the 10 nanometer property fully nor seeing the 15 nanometer property fully Maybe for some applications that is ok. But often the more you are trying to do some you know extremely interesting application which, which happens only at a particular value of that property uh, you want the size range also to be uh, of uniform size so that you see only that value of property. So, identical size is very important many times. So, this is called mono sizing of the product identical shape or morphology. So, let us say you want it to be circular let us say you want it to be flat pieces flat flakes etcetera you want all of the sample to have that sh that shape only then again that particular value of the property stands out for you to measure for you to utilize ok. So, uh, identical shape or morphology identical composition as I said impurities are always an issue so, and particularly if you go down to the atomic scale if you have only if you are sitting with a sample that has only you know 100 atoms even if you introduce 5 atoms you have a 5 percent you know uh, uh, impurity. So, your purity is down to 95 percent many times we buy you know commercially we are buying uh, powder particles from various sources which is 99.99 percent pure right 3 nines purity 5 nines purity you are getting samples. Given this situation if you actually have a sample which is in the nanometer scale, but you are actually having uh, you know only 95 percent purity that is not very helpful right. So, therefore, composition is very important and the composition should be identical across all properties. So, that is something that is very important individually dispersed mono dispersed which means the particles are not touching each other because if they touch each other they may grow see you should remember that extremely small particles are also extremely reactive uh, particles they will react with air they will react with each other they will grow because the surface area is large the surface energy is large it helps for particles to agglomerate and become larger particles with less relatively less surface area. So, they will tend to do that therefore, having mono dispersed particles where there is some space between them so that they cannot touch each other and grow is actually very useful. So, these are all goals that we have uh, mono size uh, identical morphology identical composition and mono dispersion. So, any technique whether it is top down or bottom up etcetera we are always assessing. Uh, to see that these parameters these four parameters are being met or at least to get a sense of how well these four parameters have been met. So, that you know that this is uh, what you have accomplished this is what you have not accomplished and so if you are uh, you know trying to improve your synthesis technique you will try to accomplish those remaining uh, aspects ok. So, this is the synthesis goals. What is the challenge a major challenge is safety particularly we rely on our skin to be a protective barrier we rely on our skin, skin to be a protective barrier as we saw earlier in the class the pores in our skin are only 50 microns are 50 microns in size right they are only 50 microns from the perspective of our larger scale world that we live in. But with respect to nanomaterials which are 3 orders of magnitude less in size you can actually put 1000 nanoparticles into the pore of your skin 
right if uh, assuming some similar uh, you know values you can put 1000 nanoparticles into every pore, single pore in your skin therefore if you are working in a lab that has nanoparticles or you are using a technology that consists of nanoparticles there is a chance that you can have those particles enter your skin so there is a big safety issue okay so nanoparticles that slip through our skin can enter the blood stream and interact with our immune system so you need to be careful about this both as a researcher as well as a utilizer of uh, you know uh, nano science and nanotechnology so that's a major challenge so in summary we have uh, in this class we have looked at what are nanomaterials in particular we said nanomaterials have dimensions uh, in the 1 to 100 nanometers so that is one major uh, definition nanomaterials have dimensions 1 to 100 nanometers and they are particularly of interest because they enable us to see properties and utilize properties otherwise not seen in the material this is very important only because they are showing us properties that are otherwise not seen in the material when they are in the microscopic scale or macroscopic scale that is the primary reason why nanomaterials are of interest nanomaterials can be natural they can be incidental or they can be engineered so all options are available uh, you can select you can uh, deliberately select some naturally occurring nanomaterial and use it isolate it and use it you can use some incidental material much to your advantage or you can deliberately engineer it the synthesis techniques can be top down or bottom up each has certain limitations associated with it um, uh, and for, so for example bottom up as i said uh, is something that is going atom by atom so many industries may not be readily set up for it whereas top down they may be more readily set up but in any case they have some advantages and some disadvantages so we have to recognize that and utilize these techniques within the scope of those advantages and disadvantages uniformity of the nanomaterial in terms of size in terms of dispersion in terms of morphology composition is a challenge as well as safety this is another major challenge uh, that we need to be uh, aware of and focused on uh, when we work in the area of nanomaterials so that is our uh, summary for the class, uh, this is our overall introduction for the area of uh, uh, nanomaterials, uh, science and technology and uh, through the rest of the course we will build on this. Thank you.